Shiloh National Military Park. My name is Bjorn Skaptison and I will be your, uh, I'm going to lead this program uh, for this morning. Uh, the program is called The Division That Never Was and we're going to look at uh, the experiences of the 6th Division of the United States Army, Army of the Tennessee uh, Sixth Division under command of Brigadier General Benjamin Prentice and uh, try to untangle some of the story of what happened to these people here at the battle. But also very important to it, and this is why, uh, why the program is called what it's called, uh, I want to try to figure out, try to demonstrate what a division is. Division's not just a name of a thing, and it's not just a, a, a place in a table of organization. Uh, a division is a military unit, a military organization that has a particular mission, has a particular size, has a particular scale, uh, Something specific is expected of it versus a larger organization like a corps or a smaller organization like uh, a company. So under a normal program that you might be able to get at a battlefield where a ranger has maybe 30 minutes to talk to you, the best you might get is it's going to be about 5,000 people commanded by a Brigadier General. Let's talk about the battle. We're going to have more opportunity today, today to talk about the table of organization, to talk about what a division is, what's expected of it, what that long logistical tale is about, and what's expected of that. And then also how this division, Prentice's division, the 6th division, is different and unique from other divisions that you're going to meet on the Shiloh Battlefield. And therefore, that should help us answer some of the questions about why they perform the way they do, why they accomplish what they accomplish, why they fail to accomplish some of the things that they fail to accomplish, and then how they remember themselves after the battle. That's going to be another important part of, the, of this definition of division that is not necessarily militarily, military, but social and cultural in its aspect. Um, before we're done here, we will, I'll, I'll give you a hint on what the final thesis is. The 6th Division and Prentice's Division become different things. They become different things before the end of this story. At the beginning of the story, they're the same thing. Prentice's Division is the 6th Division of Grant's Army. By the time the battle's over and people are remembering it, eh, what a division is and its definition becomes a little fuzzier and it, it's a little more fun to try to figure it out. Now, all this social and organizational stuff is going to be fun, but it's also going to happen within the context of a battlefield hike. So we're not just going to stand here and talk about tables of organization because it's too cold to talk about tables of organization outside when you could be talking about the battle. So we're going to make a perimeter of the 6th Division camp and touch on the high points of their combat because that's the opportunity we have here since we're at Shiloh National Military Park on the day of the battle at the time the battle is going on. So we are going to move, we're going to take a tour of their camp, we're also going to take a uh, a tour of the high points of the fighting, try to explain how some of the fighting happened the way it did, and we're going to try to uh, 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 answer some of the questions about what finally happened with the division after they retreated from this position about 9 o'clock in the morning. Before we start our walking, let's orient Walk. ourselves to who we're talking about. First of all, Benjamin Mayberry Prentice. Benjamin Mayberry Prentice is the commander of this division. Um, born in 
1819. His biography starts with a direct descendant of the Mayflower settlers, which I, I presume in his mind made him qualified to be a general in the army. <laughs> but he actually had plenty of military experience. But most of it was in the, the civilian, or the, the, the citizen soldier end of the military experience. A militiaman all his life. Born in the area that's now known as West Virginia, Western Virginia at the time. Eventually moved to Illinois and spent most of his life in Illinois. In 1846, he used his uh, experience in the militia to get a commission in the 1st Illinois Regiment and he led a company of the 1st Illinois Regiment to the U.S.-Mexico War. He served in General Taylor's army in his campaigns in, the nor in North Mexico, veteran of the Battle of Buena Vista. Probably also in the Battle of uh, Saltillo, but I'm not going to spend too much time on the U.S.-Mexico War. <laughs> Nevertheless, he is a combat veteran. He was a combat veteran and he commanded a company under fire in one of the major battles of that war. So, and then he came back to Illinois as a hero of the war. And that first Illinois regiment was a hero regiment as far as the people of Illinois were concerned. Uh, by 1848, when those guys were back in Illinois, that they had been in the first regiment, that they had fought at Buena Vista. Buena Vista was General Taylor's great victory over Santa Ana. And they brought the leg back, I think, from that one. And the, the wooden leg, the Santa Ana's wooden leg was captured. <laughs> they did bring his leg. <laughs> <laughs> okay. that, that, that would have been smelly. Uh, but the, the, they came back heroes, two members of that regiment. Two members of that hero regiment, the 1st Illinois Regiment, commanded Union divisions here at Shiloh. Captain Prentice commanded uh, the 6th Division, and the adjutant of that regiment, Lieutenant William Hervey Lamb Wallace, commanded the 2nd Division of Grant's Army. So the 1st Illinois Regiment from the U.S.-Mexico War contributed a lot to, to the Union Army in terms of leadership. Benjamin Prentice, by the time the Civil War started, a leading member, I believe, in a uh, member of the community in, I believe, Quincy, Illinois, because of his reputation, because of his past, because of his experience, he has chosen to command one of the first regiments of Illinois re infantry that were raised for the war, commissioned to command the 10th Illinois Regiment. Lieutenant Wallace is commissioned to command the 11th Illinois Regiment at the beginning of the Civil War. So that memory of Buena Vista, you can see, is very, very vivid to the people of Illinois. Prentice spent the summer of 1861 leading that regiment in Missouri, campaigns in Missouri, uh, trying to fight against uh, some irregular fighting, some uh, guerrilla combat protecting the railroad, protecting the uh, uh, railroad from Hannibal to St. Joseph, also doing a lot of operations in the southeastern part of Missouri where General Prentice's principal, uh, principal opponent was M. Jeff Thompson, uh, Meriwether Jefferson Thompson, the great uh, guerrilla commander, the Marion of South, the Swamp Fox of southeastern Missouri. Uh, that's what uh, Mar that was the name that Marion gave himself. Uh, the, yeah. M. Jeff Thompson gave himself. The, I'm the, I am the Swamp Fox of southeastern Missouri. During that campaign, Prentice had occasion to cooperate with Brigadier General U.S. Grant, who was leading a different force. This is after Prentice got his Brigadier General's commission, promoted to Brigadier General. There was some disagreement about the date of commission and who would be in charge when the two came together and cooperated. 
question had to be referred back to St. Louis, and word came back that General Grant would be the senior of the two and would call the shots. And that was something that General Prentiss would always remember. And uh, he would remember it when he would later be assigned to Major General Grant's army. General Prentiss was assigned to the Army of the Tennessee. General Grant brought that army up the Tennessee River in the February and March of 1862, won the battles at Fort Henry, Fort Donelson, and as he did that, his army grew. He started with a small army, a smaller army that captured Fort Henry, expanded out to about 27,000 men for the fight for Fort Donelson. And then after Fort Donelson was captured, he was given some more new recruits, and they became part of the Army of the Tennessee. As those new recruits came in, as those new regiments joined the Army, Grant organized new divisions. Now, the idea of what a division is, within this context, imagine each of these regiments is 1,000 men. Ten companies of 100 men joined Benjamin Prentiss to become the 10th Illinois Regiment. Two or three of those regiments are gathered together and placed under one commanding officer. Now you have about two to 3,000 men, and that is a brigade. Gather two or three brigades together, put them under a brigadier general, and that is a division. And then further on up, we're going to go, we're going to Army Corps and then an army. General Grant started his campaign with two divisions, McClernand and Smith. He was joined with recruits under General Lew Wallace of Indiana, and during the course of the Fort Donelson battle, enough regiments joined Wallace that, to create a third division. So that's the third division that Grant has. After the Battle of Fort Donelson, enough new troops joined the Army to make a fourth division. That was the division for General Stephen Hurlbut. And then, while just as the Army begins moving up the Tennessee River, eventually they're going to land here at Pittsburgh Landing, a fifth division is organized at Paducah and sent up the river. That is the division commanded by General William T. Sherman. All this time, more new recruits keep coming up the river. They keep coming up the river. It is April of 1862. The, all of these uh, training camps in all of the states are the last regiments are being sent to the field, and those regiments, as they become organized, as they become trained, as they muster in, are sent straight up to the field. And so, even with the five divisions organized here at Pittsburgh Landing, new regiments continue to arrive. And a new Brigadier General arrives, Benjamin Prentiss. And so Benjamin Prentiss is tasked with organizing a new division as the new regiments arrive. So that's going to be one of the qualities of this division. Every regiment will be chronologically the most recently organized regiment. And it goes to, and, and, and it's safe to assume that these regiments will also have the characteristic of being green, of being inexperienced. And some of them will have the characteristic of being not inexperienced, being unexperienced, having none at all. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about that as we go around. So it was the job of General Prentiss on the fly, in the field, to create a new division. It was his job to create the new division out of troops that just showed up whenever they showed up. He didn't, they didn't, he didn't show up with a plan saying, these guys are going to arrive on this day, these guys are going to arrive on this day, and that you could expect all of these people and that they're going to come. He just had to be here and wait for people to come on up the river. They needed to find a place to camp, to organize and train this regiment. 
the best place to do that, according to the landscape, was an area that is uh, well watered, but also high and dry. A good place for camping. So here on this plateau is one of the highest areas of the Shiloh Battlefield in the area around Pittsburgh Landing. Just to the east from here, you have the headwaters of a couple of ravines that drain out into the Tennessee River, one of them being the Spain Branch, which is an important one, a good place to get water. And then more than a mile this way, you have some drainage that heads out into Owl Creek, and that's where the 5th Division is camped. So General Prentiss is given the task of organizing a division from raw material on this place that is the best place to camp and to train. As we shall see, it is not the best place to defend if attacked. So, we've spent enough time standing around getting acquainted with the people we're going to meet. Uh, what we're going to do next is head straight down this road, which is the road that marks the four encampments of the four infantry regiments of General Prentice's 1st Division. So as we head down that road, we're going to stop briefly, and I'll introduce you to each of the infantry regiments so that we can get to know something about uh, the people that we're going to be studying today. All right, let's go. It's yours. Yeah. Do you have any idea how many regiments are on their way? I don't know. 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 I the not know. So every morning at Reveille, the men fall out of the tents, and then they come up to the parade ground, and they fall in here, and, and they, uh, they take the roll call. In the back of the camp is the officers' tents. So the bosses live back there. And uh, behind the officers' tent is where the animals live. Every infantry regiment has horses, and mules. Uh, every, re every infantry regiment uh, early in the war, but every inf infantry regiment was authorized 13 wagons. One wagon for each of the 10 companies, and then three for field and staff. All, thir all 13 of those wagons need a team to pull them. So you've got a lot of animals living with an infantry regiment. Don't think that an infantry regiment is only men walking. A lot of animals, and they live all the way in the back. Uh, a few steps beyond the animals is the officer's sink. And about 100 steps in front of the color line is the enlisted men's sink. Uh, so even in the 1860s, officer poop is better than enlisted <laughs> poop. <laughs> they got to be separate. Um, now, were those but, wagons and everything being handled by soldiers or by just hired teamsters? Good, uh, good question. Are the wagons being hired by soldiers or hired teamsters? In the Union Army, there are teamsters in the regiment. But they also hire teamsters. So there are civilian teamsters and there are uh, military wagon masters mm -hmm. and, and so on and so forth. But yeah, you also have civilians in the regiment. And when there's a camp like this one, the camp is filled with many civilians. When the army stops for any length of time, family members come down. Wives come down to visit officers. And the enlisted men don't really get necessarily get that. But the wives, so there are, there are women in the camp. The wives come down here. Uh, women, that, uh, women that need to make some money by washing clothes, you know, doing something like that to support the, the army. You're going to see those here in the Union camp. Uh, and then uh, hire, hired servants for the officers. 
officers in, in both the Union and Confederate armies, if they wished to spend their own money to do so, had the right to hire a servant to help them out, you know, be shine the boots or dust the coat or whatever. And Union officers uh, tended to take advantage of uh, men who had escaped from slavery, African-American men who had escaped from slavery to get a job. And the first job that a lot of these guys had was the servant, uh, a paid servant of a Union officer. And again, in this camp, you know, think of every regiment having about 40 commissioned officers that means every regiment might have a little cadre of about 40 freed freedmen who work for those officers. And when the battle occurs, they have to do whatever they have to do. Uh, get out of the way or help or help with the wounded or help something like that. They, they play a part in this battle. The 16th Wisconsin Regiment was one of the earlier arrivals to Prentice's division. And that simply meant that they were here around the last week of March. They arrived here around the last week of March. And as close as all of, for all of the regiments that make up this division, the 16th Wisconsin will come the closest to being what we would consider typical. Something normal for the organization and training of a regiment. They were raised in 1861. They went into camp at Camp Randall, uh, Madison, Wisconsin. They, their officers had a chance to train them. They learned to march. They got uniforms. They got their boots. They even got overcoats because it was winter time. In January of 1861, when a new governor for the state of Wisconsin was inaugurated, Lewis Harvey, they, they were the escort for the parade. And uh, Lewis, Governor Harvey and his wife were in a uh, very... Uh, opulent uh, sleigh and there was two, two horses you know pulling the sleigh and they went through the streets of Madison and then the 16th uh, Wisconsin escorted them you know they paraded for that along with some other Wisconsin regiments so eventually the 16th Wisconsin under Colonel Benjamin Allen moved down here but this is as close of any of the regiments of what you would think you have a right to expect from the point of view of Benjamin Prentiss they were recruited, they went into camp, they trained, they had a lot of time to train. Then when the time came that they felt they were ready, the government sent them to the field. That's not going to be the case for almost any of the other regiments. Let's go and meet some up. wanted to do a 21st Missouri program because they have some really interesting guys. Commanded by Colonel David Moore. Colonel David Moore, is, we're going to talk about him at our next, at one of our next stops, so I'll give you the de details on him later. Just suffice to say that if you were to make a movie about the 21st Missouri, I would probably want John Wayne to play Colonel David Moore. He was just that oversized. Uh, of a person and a personality. We'll talk more about him later. But the 21st Missouri Regiment is atypical. Atypical of a normal regiment that Prentice would assume would come. Why? They were raised in northeastern Missouri in the early part of the Civil War. Northeastern Missouri in the early part of the Civil War was in upheaval. A lot of guerrilla conflict, a lot of uh, paramilitary conflict between northern and southern sympathizing people. The 21st Missouri was raised as the first Missouri, first Northeast Missouri Home Guard, raised by David Moore. The idea in the summer of 1861 was that the society of Northeastern Missouri was so uprooted and upheaved, this upheaval, that they needed to be there to protect their community, the first Missouri Home Guard. And so they were organized and they were there to fight in northeastern Missouri at their homes, literally fighting, you know, to protect their families and their communities. There they fought the Battle of Athens uh, in August of 1861. There was a, a, a battle between paramilitary groups in northeastern Missouri at the town of Athens. 
and uh, Dave Moore and his group, we'll just call him a group, and his forces defeated Martin Green, who later became a uh, Confederate general, in the Battle of Athens. So the men that would make up the 21st Missouri have been involved in combat, in fighting, and in military activity for a long time, since the very beginning of the war. And they've even fought and they've won a battle. The problem was they were not interested in becoming a regular volunteer regiment. They were needed at home. At least that was how they felt. So when they got folded into the Union Army and sent to Tennessee, that was not a popular move, amongst, especially amongst the enlisted men. Obviously, they didn't have any choice in the matter. They're going to go where the Army sends them. But when they arrive here, they are definitely a regiment that feels like they need to be somewhere else than here. And they are definitely going to be people that have real concerns about what's going on in their homes. Nevertheless, they are here. They are under the leadership of David Moore. And uh, here you see a tablet where they do their fighting on later in the morning when they're driven back to, to their camp. So we'll meet the 21st Missouri later. But it, again, this is an atypical regiment. They have more combat experience, but they also don't, they also feel like they shouldn't have to be here. Prentice has a right to expect is the one that you would expect. They are brand new. They are brand new and they are untrained. 12th Michigan is a western Michigan regiment. They were organized at the city of Niles and uh, again commanded by Colonel Francis Quinn. Uh, one thing that we did notice or that we discussed before is that in each of these camps there's a certain number of men that are available for duty certain number of men that are available to be on the firing line in the case of a attack, and some other men who are off duty for various reasons. But since the Battle of Shiloh occurs in a camp, there's all of these people that are not in the battle are in the battle. They're on the battlefield. So in the case of uh, Prentice's division, I do have the figures for each regiment on how many men could be on the firing line, how many were for duty, and how many were, uh, were not available for duty. And a good example is uh, in the 12th Michigan, Colonel Quinn had 832 men available for duty and 896 on his roster available in the camp. That's pretty good. That's a high percentage available for duty, and I think it reflects the newness of the regiment. Uh, the regiment has not yet had that chance to have all of the men get the measles and die, or you know, be be off duty, or be uh, disabled on a campaign, or something like that. You don't see that in some of the other regiments. Uh, the 21st Missouri, who we just visited, are already down to 617 men, but 889 in the camp. So they've had much more experience in the field. Therefore. Men are sick, men are off duty, men are on detached duty, doing other things. Uh, and so the fighting strength of the 21st Regiment, 21st Missouri is less than the fighting strength of the 12th Michigan. But of course, 21st Missouri is experienced, 12th Michigan is utterly inexperienced. Let's head on down.
25th Missouri Camp. Colonel Everett Peabody, the commander of the brigade. I said when a brigade comes together, one regiment, then the next one is added, the next one is added. Now we have four regiments together. That makes a brigade. The senior most colonel is chosen to lead the brigade. So Colonel Everett Peabody in that moment keeps his rank, colonel, but is elevated from uh, commander of the 25th Missouri Regiment to commander of the 1st Brigade of the 6th Division. Now again, thinking in terms of division, what division? By the time the 1st Brigade comes online, there is no 2nd Brigade because those regiments haven't arrived yet. It is the last week of March. So think in terms of what we know is going to happen. Shiloh is going to happen in the first week of April. And the most experienced brigade has two weeks together. Uh, Colonel Everett Peabody, uh, born in Massachusetts, went to Harvard, a civil engineer by profession. Uh, he was tasked before the war with building the Hannibal and St. Joseph Railroad. So the new railroad that went from Hannibal, Missouri to St. Joseph, uh, largely he was the engineer in charge of that work. In so doing, he gained a lot of respect f from the men who worked for him. A lot of them were itinerant laborers, people that came just to build that railroad. A lot of those itinerant laborers were immigrants. A lot of those immigrants were immigrants from Germany or the various states that in 1860 uh, later became Germany, when Germany became a nation. In other words, German immigrants who built the railroad and were around the community of St. Joseph, Missouri, when the war started. And Colonel and Everett Peabody started to organize a regiment, and these guys naturally wanted to join it, wanted to, to work for him. And then other Unionist people from around northwest Missouri joined this uh, regiment. At the time, it was a battalion, meaning a battalion is a, it's a common term for a military organization that's larger than a company and smaller than a regiment. So somewhere between two and ten, ten companies. The 13th Missouri Battalion under Colonel Peabody went to Lexington, Missouri and fought in the Battle of Lexington. At the Battle of Lexington, which was a siege and a battle, uh, they were captured by Missouri forces, Southern Missouri forces under General Sterling Price, captured and paroled. Paroled, they went to St. Louis, and there upon their exchange, there when they became available for duty again. Is he calling me? I didn't hear. If he, if he says something, <laughs> you heard it? Okay. Um, the, uh, but these men who had been raised into a battalion, went and fought a battle, lost the battle, were captured, were exchanged, and sent to St. Louis, became the core of a brand new regiment, the 25th Missouri Regiment. Johnson Davis. I should just turn that down. But the 25th Missouri Regiment, the 25th Missouri Regiment has a core of combat-hardened veterans. They also know, trust, and love their commander, Colonel Everett Peabody. So they are going to be one of the most effective regiments in General Prentice's division. And it, like I said, almost all of the regiments are going to be non-standard. And in the case of the 25th Missouri, they are non-standard for what Ben Prentice can expect by being better than the typical new recruit regiment. So, 1st Brigade, commanded by Colonel Everett Peabody, 25th Missouri, 12th Michigan, 21st Missouri, and 16th Wisconsin. We've, we've met them. On the, morning, on the morning of April 6, 1862, as some of us who are here at uh, 5.30 uh, know, Colonel Peabody sent his subordinate, Major James Powell, with three companies of this regiment, two companies of the 12th Michigan, out to find the Confederates, find out if they were there. They did find the Confederates, they brought on the battle, and then they began retreating back toward this camp. And that's the next chapter of our battle uh, story. We're not going to do so much introduction to people. 
we're going to start following the uh, the operations of the battle. Are you ready? Let's go. Following the, on the morning of April 6, 1862, we know at this point from two programs and this stop that Major James Powell led five companies of Union soldiers down this road. Eventually in the Fraley Field area, they, they uncovered the Confederate surprise. They had the battle with uh, Major Hardcastle's pickets and they fell back. We're going to utilize this stop to first tell the story of what happened down the road, and then we're going to head off in that direction. Uh, so at some point, if you want to see the places involved with the first part of this part of the story, you can head down there. There are a couple markers that are really interesting to see. And I'll, uh, I'll give you directions to them. But the main part of our story is the defense, is the division and the defense of Prentice's camp. So our next move is going to be off in that direction. But as Major Powell started to fall back down this road, he encountered five companies of the 21st Missouri under command of Colonel Dave Moore coming right up this road. When the skirmish started in Fraley Field, General Prentice decided he needed to send some reinforcements out. He had not expected a reconnaissance to go out and find the enemy and start a fight, but a fight, the enemy had been found and a fight had been started. So General Prentice sent Colonel Moore up this road with five companies of the 21st Missouri. Again, the 21st Missouri is that Northeast Missouri Home Guard unit that is now in the Union Army. Colonel Moore Colonel Moore was a leading member of the Wrightsville, Missouri community. He was a merchant. Uh, he was originally a Douglas Democrat by politics. But as soon as secession occurred, the, the Republicans won the presidency. Abraham Lincoln became president. The state started to secede. The conservative Douglas Democrat Dave Moore, more than being a Democrat, more than being a conservative, was a super patriot nationalist. More than anything else, Dave Moore was a unionist. And he made sure everybody knew that by changing the sign over his dry goods store <coughs> from Dave Moore Dry Goods to D. Moore Unionist, <laughs> which is you know, uh, which is a glove thrown on the ground to all of his customers, <laughs> who tend to be who tended to be more conservative and more pro-Southern. Northern Missouri, a lot of pro-Southern sentiment in Northern Missouri, and so this starts off. It, this is at the beginning of some of that uh, local guerrilla conflict, and Dave Moore makes sure everybody knows who he is and where he stands. In fact, he changed his allegiance to the Republican Party uh, just for one more poke in the eye of his neighbors. This eventually led to that battle at Athens uh, against uh, uh, General Green and his Confederate allied Missourians. But then Dave Moore ends up down here with the 21st Missouri, leading the 21st Missouri, and he still has that broad, even overbearing character. A lot of self-confidence. That's why I think John Wayne would play him if he were a movie. A lot of self-confidence. So when, when General Prentice tells Dave Moore, take half of your regiment out to support Major Powell and beat up those Confederates and send him away, he says, I'm out of here. I'm ready to go. Come on, everybody. And so he leads five companies of the 21st Missouri up this road. At about this position, he met 
Major Powell coming back ordered Powell and the survivors of his reconnaissance to join the 21st Missouri, got Major Powell's report that the Confederates were coming, and sent word to send out the rest of the 21st Missouri Regiment. Dave Moore now has 10 companies with which to defeat 44,500 <laughs> Confederates coming up the road. 10 companies plus what's left over from the reconnaissance patrol. They march straight out this road. They meet some Wisconsin pickets, uh, Company A of the 16th Wisconsin, under uh, Captain Edward Sachs. Captain Sachs joins the column. Now Moore has a few extra people, and they head up, and in the area it's known as Sea Field. Some of us were there earlier this morning when we ended that first program. They first became engaged with the Confederates who were advancing from the southwest toward the northeast across Sea Field. And they're the first line of battle engagement of the battle occurred, meaning two large lines of battle facing each other. Of course, Moore had 800 men, and Hardy had about 9,000 coming the other direction. So it was an unequal contest, but that didn't matter to Dave Moore. He was going to fight it out right there in the sea field. Within the first few minutes of that battle, Moore was struck in the leg and carried to the rear wounded. That leg was amputated before the end of the day. Dave Moore was back on duty commanding the 21st Missouri Regiment before the Battle of Corinth in the fall of 1862. Uh, and he kept, uh, he kept clocking around through the south on that peg leg for the rest of the war. That's, the, that's this guy. But he's out of the battle by then. The next officer in command, Lieutenant Commander, Lieutenant Colonel Humphrey Woodyard, took over the force that Moore had been leading, and then fell back in this direction, fighting across the landscape. There's a bridge up yonder, and you have a chance, you can drive up there and see it, and at that bridge there's a tablet such as this one that interprets the stand that Moore's force made at that creek. Now the Confederates were moving slowly across the landscape. They were moving ponderously across this landscape. This surprise attack is not a lightning bolt out of the blue. It is a ponderous advance, unexpected to be sure. And so when they encountered Woodyard's defense, Woodyard put up a strong defense and made sure that they knew he intended to fight for that position at that creek. And they fought for more than half an hour. And the Confederates came up and they stopped and they exchanged fire and casualties were taken on both sides until finally so many Confederates came up that Woodyard had to withdraw from that position. He withdrew from that position all the way back to his camp. Woodyard took the 21st Missouri all the way back to their camp. The 16th Wisconsin companies that were fighting with him, they went all the way back to their camp. They got breakfast. They got breakfast, they filled up their cartridge boxes, and then they returned to the battle line. That's how slow that the Confederates were moving in this ponderous advance toward the camp. Nevertheless, it's a steamroller advance. It's going to get here and it's going to crush things when it arrives. So, at, as this, as this tablet, tablet tells us, by 7.30 in the morning, the entire 1st Brigade advanced from their camps. Turn around and see where we came from back there to a line of battle in front of their camp. This is the right end of the line of the battle, and the regiments are exactly the same as they are in their camps. 25th Missouri, 12th Michigan, 21st Missouri, 16th Wisconsin. The right flank of the 25th Missouri would be across the road here, about where, the, about where you start to go down into that drainage, and then the left flank is off in that direction. Confederates are coming from the southwest, so the first Confederates that hit this position are Shaver's Brigade of Arkansans, and they come up and when they hit this position, they reorient in order to present a line of battle to this line of battle, which is facing that way. On the next rise up there is where the first Confederate line of battle that hit this area became engaged. Coming from this direction, the Brigade of Sterling Wood. Sam Wood's brigade. 
still advancing to the north and to the east. They would seem to be in a perfect position to take this line in flank because Peabody's right flank is in the air. Sherman's division does not connect with it in that direction. What is that, about two or three hundred meters? Yeah, about two or three hundred meters into, into there, and then a gap, about an eighth of a mile gap between this right flank and the camp of the 53rd Ohio. Moving through that, into that gap, gap would be Wood's brigade. However, this is where fog of war takes, takes a, a hand. They do not move directly onto the flank of the 25th Missouri. They move in an oblique manner into the contested ground. The right flank of Wood's brigade marks right, marches right in between the two firing lines. This results in the right flank of Wood's brigade being fired upon by their own people in the back, which of course panics them. And so the right flank of Wood's brigade breaks and they retreat. That carries the rest of Wood's brigade back in a retreat. When Wood's retreating soldiers hit Shaver's brigade, Shaver's brigade is carried disorganized and carried to the rear. And that is the ending of the first Confederate attempt to force this position. Even though they were in a perfect position, had they known it, to take it in the flank, they didn't know where they were. They were in the woods. Imagine the smoke. Imagine the roar of battle. Imagine the tearing uh, roll of volleys of musketry. And then suddenly, Half of this brigade marches right into the middle of the firefight and they're getting shot at from both ends. So rather than taking Peabody in flank, the whole thing fell back. They had to be reorganized and then they had to be reoriented to the north and then they launched another attack on this position. That, that attack, by the time, uh, by about 8.30 in the morning, that attack carried this position back toward the camps of the 1st Brigade. Numbers tell. They still outnumbered the Federals. They pushed them back. And of course, Wood, now that he's reorganized, can move into the vacuum beyond the right of the 25th Missouri. How experienced were the Confederate troops who were attacking? How experienced were the Confederate troops who were attacking? The Arkansas regiments of Shaver's Brigade had about a year of campaigning experience. They'd been in, they'd joined very early in the war. However, they had not been in a battle. So they had a lot of training, but they didn't have the combat experience that the 25th Missouri did. Let's head off how, down the line of battle. How noisy was, I mean, does the rest of the Union troops know this is the real deal at this point? <laughs> Good question, Bruce. <laughs> does the rest of the Union Army know that it's the real deal at this point? Some do, some don't. Uh, we've got the 49th Illinois Regiment encamped just half a mile this direction that they're still boiling coffee at 7.30 in the morning when somebody rides up to give them orders and they're all still boiling coffee. They go, they've been fighting for an hour. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, the answer to your question is some did, okay. some didn't. Okay, okay, thanks. You don't have batteries involved in this thing, do you? back to where we came from, you can still see the road. On the day of the battle, they would have been, uh, this regiment, the 12th Michigan, under Colonel Francis Quinn, would have been linked right in with the left flank of the 25th uh, Missouri. Now, the 12th Michigan would have enjoyed the benefit of having someone on both their right flank and their left flank, which gives both a, a moral support and a literal military support all they have to worry about is what's in front. Eventually, the 25th Missouri, of course, had to deal with this flanking maneuver as Wood's brigade 
move through uh, the gap in the line. But the 12th Michigan didn't have to deal with that as much. A big regiment, a new regiment, and a green regiment. Colonel, uh, Colonel Quinn brought them, were only about just a few hundred yards ahead of the camp line. We are, as you saw, probably noticed before, we are on a ridge. We're on a ridge that has a little bit of drainage before us, and then at the top of the next ridge is where Shaver's Brigade eventually was. It's fairly long range, especially if they were using some of these uh, smoothbore, older smoothbore weapons. Nevertheless, two large lines of battle, 800 some men in the 12th Michigan, and then over 2,000 in the Arkansas Brigade are just hurling clouds of, of lead at each other. They aren't aiming at individuals, they're just tossing lead down range and some of those clouds when they pass through the lines are going to carry away casualties with them. Colonel Quinn writes in his report what he can witness from this position is that for the first time he could see that the Confederates were attacking in force because he could see more and more Confederate formations on every hill behind. So from here, you imagine that there's not nearly as much undergrowth. He could definitely see the line of battle he was fighting. He could also say he could see other Confederate brigades coming up on the hills behind. So imagine you can look to the right and to the, and to the other side of the road where the landscape goes up and down. Quinn could have looked to the right and seen Wood's brigade and then the brigades following that. He probably could have seen off to the right of Shaver's brigade. He might have seen the Alabama and Louisiana brigade of Adley Gladden moving in echelon to the right rear of them. And so that was the first time Colonel Quinn understood this is for real. They, they mean to take us. They mean to come and take every one of us. But what he had to deal with immediately in front of him was the same line of battle that was in front of the 25th Missouri. And for about 90 minutes, they fought that battle. Again, the Confederates fell back the first time because of the misfortune they had on their left. But once they got reorganized, they came back. And again, this scene, this was the debated ground. And this was the scene of very intense combat. And the 12th Michigan suffered very heavy casualties at this position. As, as far as you can guesstimate, we'll you talk Woods got in, in here. Mm -hmm. Would it have been about where the road is visible over there probably? Or? Yeah, yeah, and then it, where you can see the landscape starting to go up out of the drainage. Uh, that, you would imagine your targets would be there. And again, those targets are going to disappear after a few rounds. So after a few rounds firing in volley uh, or even firing at will, this landscape's going to be covered in just that blue-gray smoke kind of hanging over. And in, in time, the conf one of the Confederates over there said in time all they would, they were just aiming at the muzzle flashes that they could see across the way. Um, and so, and a, a battle devolves into that kind of confusion very quickly after just a few volleys. All right, our next move is going to take us to the 21st Missouri Tablet. There is not a trail. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so once again, you're going to all benefit from my Boy Scout training. Yeah. I advanced all the way to <laughs> Scout Second Class uh, before uh, I discovered ice hockey and girls. <laughs> but in which uh, order? If I can find 80 degrees on this compass and we follow it, we should get where we're going. Okay, so there's east. The way Mona's going. The way Mona's going. <laughs> She's just waiting for the. <laughs> that way will be her fault. <laughs>
right. and run right into it. Um, I think you're right. I think it is 80 degrees from right. the right flank of the 25th Missouri through the 12th Michigan to yeah. this. Okay. Um, there will be a difference in a minute when we go to the 16th Wisconsin because they are thrown forward about, they said, 40 rods okay. further forward than the rest of the um, than the rest of the line. We'll talk about that when we okay. get there. Okay. Oh, look, slug. Hello, slug. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he's, he's got a lot to eat too. Yeah. Look, he's already yeah. gotten. He's cleaning it for us. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. We already have volunteers. <laughs> they just need to move, spread forth. That's right. This is the, the position of the 21st Missouri. Again, 21st Missouri had been commanded by Colonel Dave Moore. He's now gone to the rear with uh, that leg wound that'll cost him his leg. Under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Humphrey Woodyard, the 21st Missouri had time to return to their camp, rest, refill their cartridge boxes, form a line of battle, and come out to this position, linked in with the 12th Michigan Regiment on their right. Their left would have been more or less in the air. That's a story for another stop, where because the 16th Wisconsin Regiment moved further to the south. But like at this point, it's the same story as the other regiments. The Confederates in, in our front, which were the Arca Arkansas troops of Colonel Bob Shaver's brigade, advanced to within close range, and they began a close range firefight. Again, it's the same time period as the other two, 7.30 in the morning to about 8.30 in the morning. Uh, a, a heavy line of battle firefight between these two regiments. Now, what we have here is an example of one battlefield phenomenon that you hear a lot about in a general way, but here for the first time we have somebody actually telling us that it happened and that it worked. And that is, that, that is the, uh, what is known as the rebel yell. Who's heard of the rebel yell? Every, we all have, and the uh, it, it was it was a yell that the Confederates would do in order to get themselves you know, wound up for a charge, for a fight, uh, and both it would both wind up themselves and it was meant to intimidate the people downrange, and they would do it right before they meant to charge. So. Here for about an hour, we have <clears throat> this firefight. And then a number of things happen. The Confederates bring some uh, artillery into the line, and the artillery starts to disorganize the, the Union line because of blowing canister shot into this line. But then the Union soldiers are directing fire at the artillery crews, and so now the Confederate artillery crews are going down and General Thomas Heinemann, the Confederate general in charge of that part of the line, said it, it's time to solve this problem right here and right now before the Yankees shoot down more of valuable artillery crew. Never mind the infantry, but they can't be killing the artillery. Those guys actually practice. So the Shaver's Brigade got the order to charge. The men of Shaver's Brigade, on their own, raised up the rebel yell. And they raised up the re rebel yell, and they hooted, and they hollered, and they did all of that stuff, and they fixed their bayonets. And when the time came to go, General Hyman said, charge. They charged bayonets, and then they just moved across the landscape at a trot, and then later at a charge, and at a run. All those thousands of fixed bayonets coming right across that plateau toward the 21st Missouri. These guys have been holding up for very well for a long time, but now their line of battle is disorganized. Disorganized by casualties, disorganized by the loss of their charismatic leader, and disorganized by uh, the artillery that had been blowing through their ranks. Morale affected. Morale affected by the loss of the touch of your comrade's elbow. This is the value of close order fighting in the Civil War. Soldiers' morale stays high when they know that their comrades are there next to them. When the next regiment is next to them, the regiment's morale remains high. 
when your comrade is next to you, you can actually feel his elbow. You probably even don't see him because you're looking downrange, loading and firing. That touch of elbow keeps the morale high and keeps the rifleman in at his post of duty. When he loses that touch because of casualty, because of disorganization, because of loss of leadership, then anything that pushes him psychologically over the edge can lead to the entire regiment giving way. One thing that could push a disorganized regiment over the edge would be 2,000 Arkansans screaming the rebel yell and then running at you with fixed bayonets as fast as they can. And that indeed is what happened here. The attack was successful. The Arkansas attack was successful. It drove the 21st uh, Missouri from the position. At the same time, they had orders to retreat. And at the same time, the 12th Michigan and the 25th Missouri mm. retreated under orders with the orders to try to reform at the color line, at the road where we started our program. Uh, and that's going to be a different part of the story when we talk about that. But here we have one of those uh, examples of where psychological warfare works, and we actually have documentation that the Confederates you know, raised the rebel yell and made the attack and drove the 21st Missouri from this position. Our next stop is, according to my notes, 140 degrees from this position. But the good news is there is a prepared trail <laughs> that goes from the right to the left. And there's also a fence at the southern end of the park. Yeah. So we can't get that lost. <laughs> <laughs> he says optimistically. Uh, but uh, yeah, optimistically, we're going to take a reading on 140 degrees and try to hold it. And if we succeed in our Boy Scout orienteering, we will go directly to the 16th Wisconsin tablet. We won't have to go down the trail to fight. These federal regiments, were they in a single line of battle? Yeah, question, were the federal regiments in a single line of battle? Single line of battle, two ranks. So front rank and rear oh, rank, okay, okay. but okay. not a supporting regiment okay. behind them. Right, right. True. They were roughly sh they were shoulder to shoulder, or more the men were ranks? shoulder to shoulder okay. in a uh, shoulder to shoulder in two ranks, rank okay. and file. So the front ranks always kneeling down. Not always kneeling down. Oh, no, right. sometimes they stand and your buddy yeah. fires right by your ear. Mm -hmm. Had they thrown mm -hmm. up any works at all briefly, or just no just works? Stood here. Yeah, okay. no, no, just as a straight, wide open, open field fight, and no prepared works. They had not right. dug in that, at all. But, okay. yeah. Are these markers roughly in, in the center of the regiments? Yes. Okay. The markers are roughly in the center of the regiment, so the colors would be here, and half the regiment would go that way, and half the regiment would be that way. So a regiment like this, 500 people <coughs> for duty. Imagine one yard per person, two ranks, minus officers. The 21st Missouri probably covered about 200 yards of... That's what's always hard to picture is what are, you know. Yeah, how far do they go? Yeah, yeah. The rebel artillery was one battery, two? Two batteries. Two batteries. Two, bat so two four-gun batteries. Guns. Huh? So probably eight guns. Probably eight guns. Eight guns. Yeah. Not probably. Yeah. yeah. And this withdraw, is it a fight? Are they fighting? Or is well, it they're withdrawing bad? under orders, but the Confederate testimony is that they just Skidabble. routed yeah. them. Yeah, they just routed them. And uh, indeed, the, the fight at the camps, the fight in front of the camps is much shorter. The Federals are not able to organize and rally the same kind of bloody uh, resistance that they give here. This is the bloodiest episode of the fight for Prince's camps. The stand about, uh, they say, 40 rods. So, everybody, 40 times 16! <laughs> Quick! Um. Um, but a few hundred yards. Okay. Yeah, don't worry. <laughs> if, if they'd not been under artillery fire before, they did well to stand at all. Yeah, that's true. a lot of troops broke Six first time. As soon as they were under artillery, yeah. yeah. All right, let's take a look here at where we're going. Yeah, go. Yeah, that's real. 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 Go. Yeah, that's real.
We have reached our next stop, and it is the position of the fourth of the regiments in the first brigade of the sixth division, and it's uh, Colonel Benjamin Allen's 16th Wisconsin Regiment. It's also the first regiment that we talked about when I introduced them to you. They were the the guard of honor for Governor Lewis Harvey and his wife Cordelia at their inauguration, and they were also the regiment that most closely, whose experience most closely resembles what Ben Prentice would have a right to expect from a newly deployed regiment coming into active duty. They were organized in 1861, they had a lot of training, they were pretty well equipped, they had good officers, they didn't have experience in combat, and that they were full. They had over 800 men of their thousand total men available for the battle here. Now the position is a little out of organization uh, because what did we just do with our first three tablets in the line of battle? Uh, I think Bruce even pointed out they were all on 80 degrees. In, in order of those first three brigades, uh, first three regiments of Peabody's brigade were all linked in with each other. But this did not happen with the 16th Wisconsin. This did not happen with Colonel Allen. Colonel Allen was directed personally by General Prentice. Again, General Prentice should have sent this order through Colonel Peabody, but he didn't. But of course, the battle is on, and he needs to make his decisions, and he makes the right the decision that he thinks is the best decision under the circumstances. General Prentice sent the 16th Wisconsin further ahead of the others. And again, this was 1862, so they measured their distance in terms of rods. And we are now 80 rods from the 16th Wisconsin camp, whereas the rest of the line of battle was 40 rods in front of their camps. The reason why they're out here is almost certainly this. Now this is not something that they wrote in the reports. It's something that we can safely infer by the behavior of the battle of the regiments in battle. The Confederates, as we said at the beginning, were attacking from the southwest to the northeast. The Federal line of battle defending the 6th Division's camps was generally oriented 180 degrees, just about due south. Now, when we were at the 25th Missouri Tablet, we saw how this created an opportunity for the Confederates to hit that line obliquely and flank it. But we also saw how that opportunity, because of the fates of war, the fog of war, did not work out. Instead of hitting the flank, they marched in between the lines, they became part of a crossfire, they fell back, that created disorganization in the entire Confederate line, and the first attack on this position failed. They had to reorganize and do it again. When they reorganized, of course, they reorganized to come right at the defending line. So Shaver's Brigade and Wood's Brigade have now redeployed to attack to the south. But, because the entire Confederate line is moving from southwest to northeast, what does that mean to the next brigade in the Confederate attack when Shaver turns and faces to the north? It means that the next brigade, Colonel Gl General Adley Gladden's Confederate brigade, lapsed behind. They fell behind because they were connected like that and then the others turned and went that way and now they fall behind. For that reason, for that same reason, 
General Prentiss seems to have perceived an opportunity to take the Confederate line in flank. Does it make sense? Yeah. Since Gladden fell behind, now Shaver's flank is open, and the 16th Wisconsin was available to do that flanking maneuver. And so General Prentiss, it seems, sent Colonel Allen forward to flank the Confederates that were attacking. And indeed, this 16th Wisconsin came forward, 800 some men in the line of battle, came forward to this position, originally under Prentiss's directions, redeployed to the southwest and fired into the flank of Shaver's brigade. Which was already there. It was which was already there that. and fighting. However, what neither Allen, what Allen didn't know and what Prentiss didn't uh, anticipate was that another Confederate brigade was coming. That Gladden had fallen behind because of the redeployment, because of the change of the direction. And so as soon as the 16th Wisconsin got into a position to fire into the flank of Shaver, Gladden came up on their flank because they've now introduced their left flank to the Confederates. So that Gladden's brigade now comes in on the left flank. And so Colonel Allen has to redeploy the 16th Wisconsin again to face south. And also he's facing south 40 rods in front of the rest of the brigade. So he's out here alone. And then likewise, now that Gladden has found the line of battle, he knows he's moving in the wrong direction. So he links into the left of Shaver, and now he has to deploy to the north. None of this is easy. None of this is easy. Moving 2,000 not very well-trained or very well-experienced men wheeling back and forth like the ice capades across the battlefield. I mean, that's the idea, but they can't do it unless they've had as much training as the ice capades have had as making the pinwheel. So but, the, so, but the Wisconsin Regiment does fine. They do fine. And again, that's a credit to the fact that they arrived on the battlefield with the amount of training that one would expect of a regiment that was formed last year, went to a regular training ground, got regular training, mustered in, got their flags, and then had seasoning before they were sent to the front. The only regiment in Prentice's division that has that characteristic. Nice. There they go. Again, the tablet tells us how long that fighting went on. 7 to about 8.30. Out here alone, the Wisconsin, 16th Wisconsin holds on. And against uh, the left flank of Gladden and the right flank of Shaver, but then again, as the rest of the brigade falls back to their brigade line, the 16th Wisconsin, under orders, fell back fighting first 40 rods, just like the, exactly the way they came out, went halfway back, made a stand. The rest of the brigade did not stand with them at that point, And then they fell back fighting to their color line. At the color line was where uh, Colonel Allen was uh, wounded and uh, Colonel, uh, or ra rather Lieutenant Colonel Fairchild was wounded. Colonel Allen had his horse killed. They brought him a backup horse and he was just mounting it. And that horse got swept away by a cloud of lead and dropped dead right at his feet. Uh, and then they fell back to the camp line. And what they did after that, we will explain at another, uh, at another stage. All right. Uh, beyond. We've reached the, just a minute, Steve. Oh. We've reached the end of the first brigade. There's another one, but we can see at, at this halfway point of our program, we can see that the brigade is not fully ready for battle. They've only been together a short time. There's not a lot that they have the ability to do. But as Stan pointed out early in our programs, early in this program, the soldiers fought remarkably well. The soldiers stood in line of battle and fired their weapons. If it was just a matter of courage and the ability to apply those muskets, the Union soldiers fought a remarkably good fight here in front, 40 or 80 rods in front of 
their camps. They didn't have the ability to do detailed tactical evolutions on the battlefield, but they had the necessity, a life and death necessity, of standing in line and defending their positions according to their orders. They did it, and a lot of them were wounded and killed in the attempt on this area. Okay? Let's move on across the road. Uh, Dion. Yeah, Steve. I was just going to say, an indication of how hard the fighting work is, but yeah, the yeah, yeah. 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 comrades and short. I have to them a long way from the point of the cell. Let's bring the artillery into the discussion. And, uh, Steve, we've got another name for you. What's that? That nobody knows how to pronounce, so we all just say it however we feel like at a given day. It's Back. either Emil Munch, oh. or maybe Emil Monk, or e maybe Emil e Monk. <laughs> <laughs> either, either way, that is the, cap the captain of the 1st Minnesota Light Artillery Battery. And the 1st Minnesota had been organized, brought down from, from uh, Minneapolis, and uh, just a few weeks before, they were assigned, they arrived on this camp, and they were assigned to the 5th Division, General W.T. Sherman. And they had been reporting to General Sherman, and they had been practicing with Sherman's troops, and getting, becoming part and parcel integral to the 5th Division. On the afternoon of the 5th of April, 1862, more evidence that this was a surprise, in case any General Grant didn't, didn't want to admit it afterwards. On the afternoon of the 5th of April, 1862, orders came to totally reorganize the camps and the assignments, mostly for the artillery and the cavalry of the Army. So on the night of April 5th, these men packed up their camp, packed, left all the people that they've been training with, and went and reported to General Benjamin Prentiss, because they're going to now be part of the artillery corps, the organic artillery to the 6th Division. And in time, of course, they will practice with General Prentiss and get to know Colonel Peabody and get to know Colonel Madison Miller and fight with the 16th Wisconsin and so on and so forth. Eventually they will. But what they don't know is that they have about eight hours to figure all of that out. Uh, they just get their tents set up, they go to bed, Reveille is sounded, it's time to fight. And indeed, this is what the, the, the people, that, the, some of the members of the, battle, the battery that chronicle this battle say. We had just gotten up our first morning in camp, we were boiling coffee, the long roll sounded, we hooked up the cannons to the limbers, hooked up the caissons to the, with the reserve ammunition to their horses and headed straight out for the battle. And lo and behold, before we got a mile, we're sitting there on our horses, the guns facing the wrong direction, with the Confederates coming down the way. The Confederates coming the other way. So immediately, Captain Monk, I'm going to call him Monk, at least for this program. Mm -hmm. Captain Monk orders, you know, Action forward! Battery into action! And so the Teamsters on, uh, on those lead teams bring the, bring the cannons forward. They have to turn around 180 so that the horses are now facing the back and the snouts are facing the enemy and drop trail and the, the, the Teamsters take the horses back uh, a few yards and with the Confederates within rifle range the first Minnesota battery comes into action for the first time. The first member of the battery killed was one of the Teamsters trying to move, trying to turn his cannon around so that it would face the enemy. He was shot off his horse and killed, the first casualty in the battery during the war. Immediately, when the trails hit the ground, they started loading these cannons with canister shot. The the, the ball bearings and the coffee can type of uh, ordnance that were used at close range 
by artillery against infantry. Canister shot was used in emergencies. The purpose of canister is not, how do I say this? It's not always according to plan. <laughs> it's there as a last ditch effort. There's no way to aim canister, it's a shotgun shell. You just splatter. point it that way and you splatter down range. And that's the first shots that the first Minnesota fire in action. Down the, down the road with the 16th Wisconsin, just up here, down the road comes the Alabamans of Gladden's Brigade and immediately we have an <coughs> artillery versus infantry fight right here. And uh, it, it goes very badly for both sides. Uh, a lot of casualties among the Alabama troops uh, caused by those clouds of, of canister blowing down range and then a lot of casualties among the uh, Minnesotans trying to work their guns here. Also, very importantly, a lot of casualties among the animals. The horses shot down in their traces. The surviving Teamsters need to jump off those horses, grab out a sharp leather knife that they all carried with them, and cut that dead animal out of the traces. One dead horse in a team of six stops the entire cannon. Am I right? Sure. Yeah. And so that Teamster's job is to jump down off that dead horse and start carving it out of its harness. Um, eventually enough horses were killed that some of the batteries had to be hooked up to the caisson. The caisson is a different wagon that carries the reserve ammunition. Uh, a little bit of trivia just to give you the scope of a battery. A Union battery has six cannons. Each cannon is pulled by a team of six horses with a limber that has the ready ammunition. <coughs> Each cannon has a caisson, which is two limbers attached together, filled with the reserve ammunition, and those are each pulled by six horses. Every six-gun battery in this battle brings 72 horses under fire. The horses need to be trained like the men, and like the men, the horses weren't trained at this point. So imagine all of the confusion that happens when these horses start experiencing the, the thunder of battle and the sting of getting shot or just getting killed and falling dead in their traces. The response of other horses in the same team tied to another horse that just got killed. You can imagine people that know something about the behavior of horses know how the horses would react, untrained horses would react under this situation. Panic. Panic. Eventually, when the position gets pushed back, these cannons, the 1st Minnesota is able to get their cannons away. Captain Monk was wounded and went to the rear. Lieutenant Fander took over. Uh, you can tell Munch, Fander, Minnesota, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, yeah a, lot of, a lot of Norwegian, uh, e either immigrants or uh, uh, Norwegian or Scandinavian uh, descendants uh, work in this battery. But eventually they escaped. Two of the six cannons were so badly damaged and lost so many horses that they went all the way to the landing and did not take part in the rest of the battle. The other four would appear on the battlefield again, and we might have a chance to talk about them as we go forward. But that's the experience of the 1st Minnesota Battery. From the, they moved here the night before. At Reveille, they moved, without their coffee, they moved forward less than a mile. Suddenly, they're in their first battle, and a couple of hours later, they are shredded, damaged, heavy casualties, heavy damage, and headed for the rear with the Confederates chasing them. Now these are six pound smooths, would that be recommend, mm -hmm. representative of what they were using? Yeah, it's, it, it's not by calculation, it's just by what's available. So you get uh, six pound smooth bores. I cannot tell you right now what the six, first Minnesota used. Sorry, I, I might have yeah. checked it, but I didn't. But the park chose to put smooth bore six pounders here. A very common six gun battery amongst the batteries that fought at Shiloh, a common combination 
was four six pounders and two howitzers. Yeah, two twelve. Yeah, two twelve pound howitzers. Uh, that didn't turn out to be a good plan, no. having two types of ammunition yeah. for one battery. But at the start of the war, it seemed like a good idea. Also, <coughs> they had to give the artillery battery whatever was in the arsenal. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I know at least three Iowa batteries were the same configuration. Same configuration. Like, yeah, two types of uh, yeah. Uh, hardware. Would they have been spread across the road? Yes. Okay. Yes. Six guns. These two guns represent the center section of the battery. Uh, a battery is divided. A six-gun battery is divided into three two-gun sections: first section, second section, third section. Left section, center section, right section. So this would be, recommend. This would. These guns would represent the center section of the first Minnesota battery. And they, uh, that, in fact, was the section that was so damaged that it had to be taken out of the battle. The right and left sections were the ones that stayed in the battle. Remember the ones that went to California? That's true. The other half of the camps of General Prentice's division. For Spainfield. And by half, I mean two regiments instead of four. So not half. And if the plan for the brigade, for the division, is to eventually have three or four brigades, then as far as the accumulation of General Prentice's division, it's not even half the strength that it might be. In fact, it's, it's probably closer to three quarters of the strength that it probably would have ended up being. But the regiments were still arriving. What we just saw in the first brigade was a fairly coherent story of a brigade fighting to defend its uh, camp. They had an advantage of about one week over the second brigade, which was also being created chronologically by the newest, greenest troops that are coming up the Tennessee River from Paducah and then from there from St. Louis, you know, and then Paducah. Uh, and this is one of those regiments, They're gonna, the 18th Missouri Regiment. And again, I'm going to give you just a little bit of background to the 18th Missouri so you know who we're dealing with, so we know what Ben Prentice was dealing with. The 18th Missouri was organized in the summer of 1861, like the 21st Missouri. Like the 21st Missouri, they were organized in northern Missouri, although they, their recruiting area was north central Missouri. Uh, they uh, had a camp at the little town of Laclede, Missouri, in north central Missouri. And uh, in fact, as a matter of trivia, the regimental sutler was named John Fletcher Pershing. Hmm. And John Fletcher Pershing from Laclede, Missouri, had an infant son in <laughs> Laclede, Missouri, that probably visited the camp of the 18th Missouri. I'll let you. I'll let you answer the question. <laughs> John J. Blackjack Pershing uh, was an infant in Laclede, Missouri at the time that the 18th Missouri was organizing there. Again, one quality that the 18th Missouri had with the 21st Missouri is are, these are Unionists living in a divided community. So from the moment they came together to form companies, it was not for the abstract purpose of going out and fighting for the Union, going out and fighting for the flag. It was for the very practical purpose of defending their homes against their neighbors. And this is the story of the war in Missouri. This is the story of the war in Missouri in 1861. So the 18th Missouri, when it comes together, the, rather than being fresh, young, naive recruits, they're actually some pretty tough paramilitary hombres who've been fighting their neighbors for a while already. And they already have some scores to settle with those neighbors. Uh, they were organized by a fellow named Morgan, W.J. Morgan. Uh, they were going to be called Morgan's Rangers. Uh, and fine, whatever says the government, you can call them whatever you want. <laughs> and we, as long as we have fighting people from northern Missouri, because we've got this problem, and the guerrillas get on the Hannibal and St. Joseph Railroad, the same one that Colonel Peabody helped build. And uh, so they work there, but they don't get much training. They just go straight to fighting their neighbors, uh, as they have been doing for some time. The regiment was then moved to far western Missouri, the town of Weston, Missouri, in the far western part of the state. 
uh, there, immediately after they arrived, uh, some Confederate sympathizers burned down a railroad bridge, so Colonel Morgan and the 18th Missouri grabbed a couple guys from local guys that they declared to be notorious rebels, took them out to the ruins of the railroad bridge, and shot them. Then, a few days later, Weston eh, caught on fire. Who knows why? It just did. Uh, and so, very soon, the new commander in Missouri, in St. Louis, the brand new commander in Missouri, General Henry W. Halleck, arrives to take over from General Fremont, who had been sacked, and Halleck came to take over. And the first thing on his desk, somebody burned down Weston. You've got a problem regiment. You've got a problem regiment, a disorganized, violent group of Unionists out in western Missouri taking out their personal vendettas against pro-Southern civilians. And so the first order that Halleck gave with respect to the 18th Missouri was get them out of Weston, get them on train cars, get them back to St. Louis, and while you're doing it, Colonel Morgan, you're fired. Fired the colonel, took care of a lot of other the elected officers that were in charge of the regiment, and now he's got these hard cases stuck with him in St. Louis. At the same time, that General Grant needs reinforcements. <laughs> so as soon as they arrive in St. Louis, the 18th Missouri has a couple of days to start doing some uh, what you might call remedial training. Um, and then General Halleck needs to find somebody to take over this regiment. So he goes to a well-respected artillery battery. There's an officer in that battery with a lot of experience, combat experience, who's been in the Battle of Wilson's Creek, uh, with uh, where General Lyon was killed and all that, uh, Captain Madison Miller. And he takes Captain Miller and he says, Captain Miller, congratulations, you're promoted all the way to Colonel. You're in charge of these guys. Madison Miller took over the 18th Missouri with only a couple of days to get them organized and get them ready, then get them onto the steamboat and straight up the Tennessee River, arriving here just a few days before the battle. I've forgotten exactly the day they arrived, but it were, by now we're talking about maybe the 29th of March, the 30th of March, maybe one week before we know that the Battle of Shiloh is going to happen. They march out here and they become the first regiment that is part of Prentice's 2nd Brigade. A few days Later, the 61st Illinois would arrive, green as gourds from eastern Illinois. Again, like that 12th Michigan Regiment, no training at all. They just organized, raised up their hands, said the Pledge of Allegiance, they gave them a flag and some weapons, and sent them to Grant. So, at the, by the, by the, 5th of April, 1862, this is the 2nd Brigade of Prentice's Division, and that's all he has as of that moment. Colonel Madison Miller is in charge of both regiments. He's had two or three days to get used to them. Now, we're also going to talk about a third regiment that is going to join this brigade and fight with them in this battle, but we're going to talk about them when we get to their position. During the battle, the 18th Missouri, again, they're, they're, they're kind of hard cases, but they're also, like I said, pretty tough guys who are used to fighting and have been fi fighting for a long time. So when the Confederates began to come, when Gladden's brigade came from southwest to northeast across that road, they redeployed facing this direction and attacked the, uh, attacked the cannons at Monk's Battery, and then here, that tablet down there is the 5th Ohio Battery, six more cannons firing down the road. Then the next regiment in the line of battle is the 18th Missouri. Gladden had to redeploy from facing the northeast to facing the north and attack straight across this field. Originally, you can see Prentice sent these two regiments, the 18th Missouri 
and the 61st was 61st Illinois to the far end of the field. That placed them far in front of the 1st Brigade. So after keeping them there for a while and engaging in some, um, engaging in some skirmishing, they fell back to this edge of the field, which would give them the benefit of the Confederates would have to cross the field in order to engage them. And this is where they became engaged at 8.30 to 9. And when Gladden's Alabamans, and this is, the front here was probably, I think, probably the first Louisiana regiment under Colonel Adams, came up, over, came up out of that ravine, across the field, and for 30 minutes, a very bloody stand-up fight occurred right here in the Spain field. Uh, very bloody for the 18th Missouri, casualties taken off to the rear, right in front of their camp. If you turn around, you see the camp marker. So they're just a few feet in front of their tents, and the Confederates are attacking them from the front. Again, the first attack was repelled, just like they were in Shaver's Brigade. The second attack came through in much stronger force, and after very bloody fighting, drove the 18th back to their camp, into the camp, through the camp, the camp broke up their uh, organization, and after that it was a rout, heading straight to the rear. Let's head off. Before we go, we did walk past the Gladden Mortuary Monument, right? Want to go ahead and pick up that piece of business. In Gladden's very first attack, General Adley Gladden, the commander, South Carolinian, commander of this Brigade of Alabama and Louisiana troops, led his troops straight up the road engaged the 16th Wisconsin straight across the road and then came up against these two batteries. He was struck in the arm. He was struck in the upper part of the arm, tore it right out of the shoulder. It was a mortal wound mm -hmm. and he was carried to the rear and died later that day. Immediately the command of the brigade, this Confederate brigade, was taken over by uh, Colonel uh, Daniel Adams and Colonel Adams led the second attack across this position, and the attack that captured the camp, and I believe that is the attack where Colonel Adams was struck in the head and very badly wounded. And then he was out of the battle for, he was out of the war for a little while. Uh, and then the next commander of that brigade was a colonel from Alabama named Zachariah Dees, and we might, we might talk about him a little bit later in the day. Uh, because Gladden's brigade continues to fight. Let's head to our next stop. Let's do questions while we move. And we'll head to the next stop right down here. Yeah. Yeah. So I think when they got here, they were down there in the death lane. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because we've already talked about 61st Illinois. Other than, other than to use the same phrase I used before, green as gourds, straight from home. And they'd been here just a couple of days, uh, yet Colonel Jacob Fry led them to the front. And like the men in the 1st Brigade, here they stood and here they fought. They didn't know much, but of course they could stand in line and fire their weapons. And indeed they knocked down a lot of Alabama troops on the other side of the field. Yet, there wasn't much they could do to respond to a changing uh, events on the battlefield. They could not change their front in a disciplined manner. They could not move from right to left. They could not, under fire, change from you know, line of battle to column of march and go someplace quickly and then redeploy again. They just didn't have, the, they didn't have those chops yet. And so, after the fighting, they were driven from this position, driven into their camps, driven through the camps, and then uh, retreated to the rear in rout. And they do not appear on the battlefield again until much later in the afternoon, and then not as part of uh, Prentice's division. They go fight somewhere else. Uh, we could talk more about the 61st Illinois. They have some very interesting chroniclers. Uh, Lander, 
uh, uh, Leander Stowell? 61st Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, he writes some really cool stuff. But the story is the same as the other ones. There's a much more interesting story down the road. Let's go talk about the 18th Wisconsin. <laughs> Here's where the story gets interesting. Uh, as if a story about uh, 5,000, about 5,500 half-trained, untrained, ill-disciplined, unled, badly led, well-led, perfectly led, wonderfully led, inspirationally led, men did their best with very little preparation to fight the worst kind of battle under the worst kind of conditions that would be experienced in the Civil War. Close range combat against an enemy in superior numbers, attacking with the advantage of surprise, intent on destroying you and everything you've brought with you to Tennessee. The greenest men of the greenest division placed in the front of the line of battle. We might discuss the wisdom of doing that under some other circumstances where we're talking about General Grant and General Sherman and their decisions. But I want to talk about this division. I want to talk about Prentice's division. And indeed, for the purposes of technicality, we are no longer talking about General Prentice's division. We are talking about the 18th Wisconsin Regiment, which was supposed to be part of General Prentice's division, but legally speaking, technically speaking, in the table of organization, was not on the day of battle. What's the story of the 18th Wisconsin Regiment? Well, like their division, they're really just a regiment in name. On March 20th, just about the time the first regiments, 25th Missouri, were reporting to General Prentiss to become part of this division, the men of the 18th Wisconsin were standing in parade in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in their camp, taking their oath as soldiers. Then, without any training, Without any time on the drill field, they put them on trains and moved them with extraordinary efficiency to Shiloh, Tennessee. Never a stop, even a day, for drilling, for preparation. On the evening of the 5th of April, 1862, General J Colonel James Albin in the 18th Wisconsin, arrived at Pittsburgh Landing over here and was supposed to have made his report to General Prentice that he was here. He didn't make that report, but he did bring the regiment with its camp out to the place where they would camp. And he made camp right here. And certainly on the morning of the 6th of April, Sunday the 6th of April, James Albin would go ahead and report and give his report to General Prentiss and thus become part of the 6th Division. By example, another regiment, the 16th Iowa Regiment, also arrived at Pittsburgh Landing on the evening of April 5th. The commander of that regiment made camp at the landing, but sent a report to General Prentiss. Thus, the 16th Iowa Regiment is part of Prentiss's division in the battle. During the battle, the 16th Iowa was sent by General Grant to another part of the battlefield and fought an entirely different battle under different circumstances and never appeared on Prentice's order of battle. That's the state, that's illustrative of the state of 
disorganization of, of, of not yet fully organized state <laughs> of Prentice's division. He has he has the 16th Wisconsin that's supposed to be on his battle line and they never show up and he has the 18th Wisconsin in his camp but they don't actually belong to his brigade to his division yet. Now that's the to some extent that's the administrative problem of the 6th Division, of Prentice's Division, but administrative problems are real problems. They result in General Prentice having expectations of being able to perform a certain type of battle, uh, a certain type of military mission with a certain amount of force. He's got it on paper, it ought to be on the field. It's not. The 18th Wisconsin Regiment. They come out on the 9th, on the night of April 5th, they set up their tents, they make coffee, they go to bed without any training since the day they put up their hand and said the Oath of Allegiance. On the morning of April 6th, here come the Confederates. They form on their color line. They've got 800 men. They've got over 800 men, so they're all here. But they are literally civilians in blue suits with who've been handed muskets. Downrange, you see the red tablet there. That's the, it marks the position of a Mississippi Brigade. General James Chalmers, Mississippi Brigade. Quite possibly the best trained, best experienced brigade in either army on the battlefield. Uh, very fine soldier, armed with Enfield rifle muskets good rifle muscle in a position in that ravine down there. They can stand on the edge of the ravine and just shoot down the Wisconsin soldiers who are standing here in front of their camp like targets. Off to the left, another regiment that was supposed to be in the brigade but is not yet officially reported, the 15th Mi Michigan moved up on the left flank of the 18th Wisconsin. There they stood when their colonel learned that they had no ammunition. They'd, come, they'd marched all the way to the front, taken a position in the line of battle with no ammunition. Colonel John Oliver turned that, turned that regiment around and marched to the rear, leaving the left flank of the 18th Wisconsin in the air. To the extent it mattered, because there's nothing that these poor guys would be capable of doing uh, to protect themselves from what's happening. The Confederates, the Mississippians, did in fact move around the left flank. They also came around the right flank as the rest of the brigade, as the rest of Prince's division, collapsed and moved to the south. And here, the 18th Wisconsin Regiment was overwhelmed by Confederates. And well-aimed volleys of uh, Enfield rifle muskets cutting right through this rank, these ranks of men that, like I said, are little, of little more value at this point in their career than targets. And many of them were cut down at this position right in front of their camp. They fell back through the camp and the route began and then they fell back in a state of route more than a mile, about a mile, to where they finally were rallied. Now, we've arrived at the last position of any of the infantry regiments of Prentice's division. We're about to head back to our cars, but we're going to take an alternate route so that we don't have to re go back through our, uh, uh, you know, retrace our steps. From here, we're going to go going to follow the, imagine we're following the route of these survivors of this, you know, virtual massacre here on the, in front of the 18th Wisconsin camp. We're going to follow them back until we get to the headquarters of Prentice's division, and that's where we're going to finish our program. All right? It does mean, if anybody isn't here in their best footwear, we're going down. <laughs> Same direction the water's going. So probably we're, the water will meet us when we meet 
get to the bottom of the hole. Now without becoming distracted, remember everything you're doing now, running, there's someone shooting at your back, carrying that nine pound rifle, falling, and wondering what on earth compelled you to sign up for the army. <laughs> I wish I was back in Milwaukee. I wish I was back in Milwaukee. <laughs> one doesn't stay frequent. <laughs> okay. I don't get that. <laughs> um, Ambrose Bierce yeah. writes a nice little bit in his What I Saw of Shiloh essay mm -hmm. where he talks about the geographical or the yeah, the phenomenon of burning battlefields like this one. And the idea is the, the burning at Shiloh is a smoldering. Yeah. Lots of smoke and some fire. And it's because of the layers and layers and layers of accretions of leaves and so on and so forth that down at the bottom, it's still dry enough to smolt to catch fire. Uh -huh. And then at the top, when it gets wet, things the, the fire's already started, so it's smoldering. So the burning in the hornet's nest, or what the burning that uh, Bierce described in the Ninth Illinois Ravine, is a, uh, a smoldering, lots of smoke. Yeah. And then very slowly creeping, sl smoldering fire, which does, in, the, in both the... Yeah, because that 44th Indiana County in the Hornet's Nest on right. about, like, you know, 125 dead rebels that were scorched, that scorched burned. And, and burned. Yeah, and it was the, the helpless, you know, shot down, unable to move. But I thought about that. I was like, wait a minute, everything's soaking wet. I don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good thought. Yeah, it's a, it's a good thought. But, yeah, it's the, um, the understory. Uh, when the understory is dry, it can burn and then, and then smolders. Yeah. Uh, at this point, this is the headquarters of Prentice's division, which I think is a great place to end a program called the division that never was. <laughs> of course it was a division. Of course it existed. It had more than one brigade. If that's the definition of a division, then it existed. It was commanded by a brigadier general. General Prentice. If that's the definition, indeed the division existed. However, if the definition of a division, an entity in a table of organization of an army whose job is to go out and do army things, maneuver across the landscape, fight the enemy, take objectives, defend camps, then a division is a component of that army that the division commander and the army commander ought to be able to expect a certain amount of force from. A division in its operational capacity has a long, well-organized logistical trail. Bullets come from somewhere. Food comes from somewhere. There's a quartermaster. There's a commissary. Divisions have liaison between the units, meaning that the commanding officers of the units have worked together. When we looked at the first brigade, and they had three of their regiments in a straight line of battle at 80 degrees. That means there are men, officers, at each right and left flank whose jobs were to know what the other was up to and keep contact. We're not just regiments running around willy-nilly. Now we are three, four regiments together working as a brigade. If a division is defined by these aspects of 
the amount of military force that an army commander ought to be able to expect from it, then what happened with Prentice's division cannot necessarily qualify it as a fully formed, fully functioning division in Grant's army. Yet, here they were, camped in the front of the army. The closest soldiers, along with General Sherman's 5th Division, to the enemy at Corinth. And here we will bring in some of the des decisions that General Grant, General Sherman, General Halleck made on the strategic level. And the mistakes that were made in the Union leadership moving into this battle. They did not expect the Confederates to attack. So overconfident was the Union leadership that the next step of this campaign would be forward to Corinth, where the Confederates would have to defend their town against our army, that they put the greenest soldiers in the very front of their camp. Sometimes we talk about, well, they Evidence that they were surprised was that they didn't build fortifications. Sure. Better evidence that they were surprised meant that they put a group of soldiers, called a division, but still very much in the embryonic stage of organization and training at the front of their camp. And when the Confederates attacked, those green troops inexperienced leaders and an organization without any experience working together was asked to perform the job of a division defending the crucial center of the camp. I want to reflect back on something that Stan said near the beginning of our program. Given all of these drawbacks given the disadvantage of surprise, the disadvantage of lack of experience, the disadvantage of lack of organization, the private soldiers, non-commissioned officers, and junior line officers, and indeed a lot of the field officers of the regiments, marched forth and gave the Confederates battle, gave battle to an overwhelming force of better organized, better trained enemies coming in large force with the intent of destroying them and stood in front of their camps and fought and died and delivered very heavy casualties upon the attacking organizations. General Gladden's brigade is just one example of one of the Confederate brigades that was shredded in their very first encounter and that an encounter with green Union troops. So to say that Prentice's division is the division that never was is not to say that they were not great. It's not to say that they did not sacrifice their lives for their country and their cause. It is to say that they were ill-served by their leadership in placing them in a position where they could not possibly fulfill the mission that was given to the organization that bore the name Division. <clears throat> now, there's more to the story, but that story does not happen here, so <laughs> we're not necessarily going to pick it up. But very quickly, routed 18th Wisconsin, passes over this area, so does the 61st Illinois, so does the rest of the division, and they route to the rear, along with General Prentice and his headquarters. They rally at a farm lane less than a mile north of here, known as the Sunken Road, which will become the center of the Union line, and there are uh, less than a thousand, or about a thousand, of the men that had started out as 5,500 in the morning 
took position in the center of the center of the Union line, defended the sunken road, and a lot of them were captured at the end of the day. Captured with their commander, General Benjamin Prentiss. Those men who were captured in the hornet's nest, the next chapter in their story is prison camp. Prison camps throughout, throughout Dixie, going here, going there. Six months later, General Prentiss was uh, paroled and exchanged. Shortly after that, the other men who were captured were paroled and exchanged. But General Prentiss never returned to the command of the 6th Division. So, when I say the division that never was, another aspect of it is Prentiss's division only exists on the 6th of April. 1862, and the weeks before that. And even on the day it fought its battle, it was not a full division. The 6th Division of the Army of the Tennessee, under a new commander, General Thomas McKean, eventually came together, did some very good work together, organized, went to Corinth, and in October of 1862 played a key role in defending that town against the Confederate attack in the Battle of Corinth, Mississippi. So the 6th Division exists. I'm not saying that the 6th Division is, not, is the division that never was. Prentice's division is the division that never was. And as I, as I said before, it's because uh, these were green, unorganized men, ill-served by their military leadership, who nevertheless, uh, who nevertheless gave an enormously impressive and inspiring feat of arms in trying to defend their camp against an overwhelming attack. Bjorn? Bjorn? Yes. Um, is it correct that not only, you know, that it was not well set up, but that also General Grant had been given orders that he was not to engage until General Buell caught up with him and that contributed even more to the mess? Mm -hmm. Is it General Grant? That's true. Oh, it was, it was not, it, and and I also read in Shelby Foote's Shiloh mm -hmm. that the Mississippians and Alabamans and so on gave full credit to Prentice's men standing here and at the sunken road. They said they were the fightingest men mm -hmm. they ever saw mm -hmm. in either mm -hmm. army. Yep. Well, of course, Shelby is writing a novel, he, but he oh, is yeah. basing it. He is basing, basing it on, on uh, yeah. He is basing yeah. it on the attitude on the that the the. Uh, that the Confederates took. And yes, what you said about the, the overall strategic aim is that General Grant was under strict orders from General Halleck not to bring on a battle. That when General Buell got here, General Halleck would take over the whole, the two armies together, and that they would go down to Corinth where they would attack the Confederates there. It is General Johnston who refused to play that game by coming out of Corinth and attacking here. But general, again, the overconfidence and the myopia, if you will, of the Union commanders from Halleck to, to Grant, Grant to yeah. Sherman is that why defend? We're not going to defend, we're attacking. Yeah. Uh, so it was uh, Johnson that caught them by surprise by coming up here and attacking. Were they at all, is it possible they were unaware as to the full extent of the Confederate forces? Like, were they unaware of the number of men in uh, Corinth, for instance? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. They no they, yeah. I, well, you, yeah, you say were they unaware of the number of men in Corinth. They knew a major Confederate army was in Corinth. Mm -hmm. oh, they okay. knew uh, absolutely that, that reinforcements were being sent from the four corners of the Confederacy to Corinth, and that the Confederates considered Corinth a strategic do or die to okay. defend. Thus, let's not attack them until we get everybody together. Yeah. So they knew Corinth was dangerous. They knew there was a big army there. And they simply refused to acknowledge that the Confederates would leave Corinth yeah. and attack them here. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you very much for coming out uh, to Shiloh. There's a lot more going on today. And... Uh, I have uh, I have a schedule here somewhere. Check check with me after we're done. I can tell you what's I happening. Got it right here if you want. Oh, What's the next program? Uh, here I'll just give it to you.
There's the truth of that. That's new. Okay. Um, that when his division was driven from their camps, they were driven back to the color line. They attempt to make a stand at the color line. They were driven back into the camps. Once they were driven into the standing tents, the formations were broken up and the men continued to rout to the rear. General Prentice said he gave an order, and other people quote this order, that they were to fall back and fight on their own accord from whatever cover they could find. So that as they fell back, they would search out a tree, they would search out a piece of terrain, some place to take cover and resist as much as they could until they reached a point where they could rally. Now, I think that is, I think it's like, as I intimate, that, that seems convincing evidence that even though Prentice wrote his report after he was released uh, from, from captivity in November, that he gave that order and since it was repeated in other reports, it seems to me that the men retreating got the order and that therefore many of them would have tried to comply, right? So as we can still see white, a white flash from the base of Prentice's headquarters monument back there, and we can see the Hamburg Purdy Road on top of the next rise here. So this is an aspect of this moment of change between chapters of the battle. Uh, they're not standing and fighting, they're retreating, but they're not just retreating. Many of them, under orders, are going to try to resist. Furthermore, we know that the Confederates stopped in the camps to loot them. Nevertheless, many Confederates, the most motivated soldiers and the most dedicated officers, would have gotten together anybody they could, even if it's just 25 or 50 men under a lieutenant to keep going, keep going, keep going. That's what Johnston was talking about when he was scolding his men. We did not come here to do this. He's trying to tell them, go, 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 go. If we're going to win this battle, we have to go. And we can assume that many lower officers, the better quality of lower echelon officers, were already taking men forward to try to pursue the retreating Yankees. Therefore, we are on a battlefield. Even though there are not tablets here, even though there are not large formations that we can say, put an X on the ground and say, they were here and they did this, we know that this was a site of conflict. That during the course of the retreat, there would have been members of the 18th Wisconsin Regiment or the 61st Illinois, Illinois Regiment, uh, stopping here under a sergeant, under a corporal, under a lieutenant to take cover behind a tree, to find a fold of ground, to get down where this drainage creates a bit of a trench and fight, fire one, two, three shots, as, long, as many as they could, and we know that there would have been Confederates pursuing them in small numbers. It would have been a skirmish kind of fighting. Uh, what At the time, what they called Indian fighting. You know, running around through the woods, everybody taking cover, taking a shot at whoever they could see, and then falling back to the next type of cover. And that's, that's a battle that doesn't appear in the official reports. And therefore, it's in the narrative that historians create later, that's the kind of battle that doesn't get into the histories. Because there's not primary source evidence, there's not much primary source evidence telling the story of that battle, the skirmish fighting, the Indian fighting, Indian style fighting. Yet, we do know from the reports that the men were ordered to do it, and certainly some of them did. So, there's no tablets here that tell that story, but that's what happened here at 9.15, 9.30 on the morning of April 6, 1862. But beyond, probably some of the survivors told that kind of story, didn't they, or did they? Did the survivors tell that kind of story? The survivors would not have said, said that we, I, I hid behind this tree and fought for 15 minutes so that you could put a tablet there. They would say 
uh, and you probably will find this in reminiscences or letters or something like that, we fell back fighting. Yes. We fell back, I, I stopped behind a tree and took two shots and then continued to the rear. Okay. Sergeant Johnson organized eight men here and we fought yes. and then after firing two shots we fell back. Mm -hmm. You'll find stuff like that. These yeah. are not quotes, but... But it's not the stuff that goes in a report. Right, right. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. You know, Chris, you, can, you hear people say, you can hold you. Yeah. 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 Some people into this interest. Yeah. I'm living in New York for time right. for work, mm -hmm. and I became really yeah, happy about the different economies. Make the decision on that.